the, the caption feature accessible from the three dots button, always on the bottom of the screen, uh, to get some Google help for the comprehension of the speech in case it is needed. Uh, as you see, the meeting is organized in three main sessions, two in the morning to illustrate the research results, and one in the afternoon to discuss with our distinguished researchers in the panel session. Um, our intention is to have a lively meeting, interactive meeting, um, so we left a relatively long time for discussion at the end of each presentation. We encourage you to make questions and to use the chat for make questions. The, the button for the chat is uh, at the, um, the right hand of your screen, either on the bottom or uh, at the top, depending on your uh, Google browser. And at the end of each talk, you will be given the floor to make your question in voice video in the chat order. The moderators can ask the support of Julia, our PhD student in data science, uh, to um, follow the, the questions on the chat. Please briefly state your name and affiliation before making the questions. It is now my pleasure to leave the floor to Marike van der Berf, head of the disease program on sexually transmitted infections, bloodborne viruses, and TB at the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, who will moderate the first session together with Piotr Jablonski, head of St. Petersburg Institute of Tissue Pulmonology and, prof and professor at St. Petersburg University. Thank you. Thank you, and a warm welcome to the meeting HIV, TB, HIV, uh, EU, Russia cooperation results. Um, as a reminder, the main objective of this meeting is to present and discuss outcomes and findings from the CARE Common Action and other projects and initiatives in the frame of recent collaborative research in the WHO European region. As said, I will moder be moderating this first session together with uh, Piotr Jablonski, and I'm very happy to do so. Um, I propose that we start with the first uh, greetings and overview of the day, which will be done by Alessandra Martini. Alessandra is a policy officer of the European Commission, uh, working in the unit of combating diseases in the Director General of Research and Innovation. Since 2006, she has been involved in designing research policies and has been responsible for portfolio management on infectious diseases. She has been the research officer responsible for the CARE project. Uh, Alessandra, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marike and uh, for the introduction. And uh, first of all, I would like to welcome uh, everybody uh, and all the um, attendees that are uh, participating to this uh, final meeting of uh, CARE. So the members of the consortium led by Francesca and Jans uh, Lundgren, but uh, also the members of the Scientific and Ethics Advisory Board and um, all the um, uh, colleagues uh, that are uh, working at the EU delegation in Moscow. And they are working also in the international uh, cooperation uh, sector of uh, the European Commission. And uh, as I said, all the clinicians and scientists and all those that are uh, also less visible, but made uh, the success of the project and made it happen. Um, so what I want to say, just a brief uh, description of what uh, of the history and the genesis of care, because it all initiated in 2017 um, with a dialogue and uh, um, uh, collaborative environment between the European Union and the Russian Federation. And the dialogue in particular between uh, the colleagues uh, at the European Commission and uh, colleagues in the Ministry of uh, Science and Higher Education with the intention to boost the participation of uh, countries such as the Russian Federation in, the, in our uh, funding program, research funding program. Um, so what we chose uh, was a topic uh, um, 
on the collaboration, which is to boost the collaboration um, for uh, the better understanding and the, uh, an improved clinical management of uh, patients within the three epidemics, uh, the HIV, tuberculosis, and the viral hepatitis C, including the comorbidities. Um, these are uh, areas that we have been supporting extensively in the current program, but also previously since uh, the, um, really since the very early rounds of our research uh, programs. And uh, let's say for which, uh, despite the progress, and we all know the impressive progress that has been made uh, in, the, in, the, in the decades, there are still a lot of questions to be answered. There is a uh, still a lot of uh, room, uh, not only for improvement, but really for development of uh, interventions uh, and uh, tools for the treatment uh, of patients affected by the infections. And uh, for which both within the European Union countries, but also in, the, also in the Russian Federation and also in the neighboring countries, there are excellent scientists and clinicians which have uh, experience, extensive experience in the field, and they are uh, also willing to collaborate uh, for addressing and providing answers to the questions which still remain uh, in the. In, in this uh, environment. Uh, so from our dialogue with the, with the, with the colleagues, uh, we have uh, designed and implemented a, um, a coordinated uh, call uh, from which the CARE project, but as well uh, our, our REST TB, who is also represented today, will also participate today at the meeting have been positively selected by both uh, uh, funding agency, in this case we are policy, but also funding agency. And they have uh, since then uh, started to work uh, with uh, funding for a two years program. And um, they had really a stunning research agenda. I mean, they have been selected really in a, in a competitive environment because um, of the complexity and the well-designed agenda that they have uh, uh, been able uh, to put together um, in, in, a, in a short period of time and in collaborations which are uh, um, cross borders uh, as, you, uh, as, you, as you know in different uh, countries. So I've been following CARE since, as Francesca said, since the very start uh, with really interest and enthusiasm because um, uh, indeed, um, well, I will not preempt it because the scope of this uh, workshop is indeed to present the results. But already uh, at the kickoff meeting back uh, in 2018 in Rome, uh, the potential uh, of the project and the basis on which it was built were uh, stunning indeed. Um, so today, I think uh, you have a, an excellent opportunity to showcase the results and the work we have been doing, but not only, it's also for the stimulation of the discussions on the impact of these results on the long term and the perspective for the, for the future possibilities um, to maintain and to um, make the best use of uh, uh, what you have been able uh, to achieve uh, so far. One thing I like to say is that, as we all know, um, we have been going through a very uh, intensive uh, period because of the COVID uh, pandemic. And uh, this has really impacted and uh, badly affected, uh, okay, uh, let's say the entire population of the globe but particularly at the beginning, the scientists uh, and the clinicians and all the staff working in hospitals and working on the research for infectious diseases has been impacted and redirected the efforts towards the response of the pandemic. And uh, we have recognized that and therefore there was also an extension of the grant. But what, what is really to acknowledge here, it was Nevertheless, the uh, strong commitment that you all prove towards the agenda you have and the work to be done, that despite these difficulties, there was the continuation of the work, and this is really impressing, and I would like really to acknowledge that. 
Um, so um, going to the uh, to the agenda, as uh, we have the day uh, in front of us, there will be indeed presentations uh, in the morning on the results that have been achieved so far, with plenty of space in the to discussions, open discussions at the end of each presentation, as Francesca also indicated in terms of how it is organized. There will be a break at uh, 10 o'clock, um, followed by uh, additional presentation and discussions. In the afternoon, uh, there will be, an, um, after the uh, lunch break, there will be a final session and panel discussion indeed on the perspective and impact of the scientific cooperation that you all work on in uh, addressing HIV, tuberculosis and uh, hepatitis C um, in the WHO uh, region. And uh, there is also a link with the current uh, pandemic caused by SARS-CoV-2. So um, I really would like to thank you all for the effort you have been doing so far. I would like to thank our colleagues at the Russian delegation and here in Brussels in the international cooperation that have been also key in uh, uh, the dialogue with the ministries uh, um, in Moscow for the possibility uh, to have uh, um, this cooperation together and i'm looking forward to the uh, to the discussions and to the uh, presentations one thing i have to say and francesca and the organizer know already unfortunately i am uh, we are uh, uh, doing running evaluations for a covid uh, um, expression of interest at the moment so i will not be able to follow the entire day I will do my best to follow as much as possible, but nonetheless, if there are questions during the period of my absence uh, that are put place on the chat, I will, uh, Francesca and Julia will be able then to send them to me and uh, I will uh, do my best to answer if, it, if it's not during the day, in the, in the, in the next day and provide the uh, additional information or support wherever is needed. Thank you, and I leave the floor back to Marite. Thank you, Alessandra, for these nice uh, introductory words about the and explaining how the CARE project was uh, initiated. Um, we quickly go to the first presentation, which will be by Francis Dobjevsky. Francis is a clinical microbiologist and professor of global health and tuberculosis at the Department of Infectious Disease at Imperial College. Uh, he is work package leader of work package two of the CARE project, which is the work package novel diagnostic approaches in TB and MDR-TB and biomarkers of treatment response. Uh, Francis, the floor is yours. Oh, and please do not forget to put your questions in the chat. So thank you very much, Marika, and uh, good morning to everybody at Dobruto. Um, it's very, it's a great honor to speak to you all this morning. Um, over the next 10 uh, to 15 minutes, I'm going to try and give a summary um, of our work package. It won't include everything, uh, but I hope it will give you a flavor um, of what we've been trying to do. And I'm very grateful for Francesca, who's going to be operating the slides. So you'll be seeing a, a magical uh, performance uh, from Rome there. Um, and I will just be asking her to, to, to move the slides when I need them. The main partners in this work package are, are on the left, our, our colleagues in, in uh, Lithuania, in Vilnius, uh, and also in, in Arhangelsk. And I'll show you pictures of them at the end um, to, to show you their faces. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So in terms of tuberculosis, by way of introduction for this talk and, and for the next work package, you know, where are we? Well, the, the global tuberculosis report, uh, the most recent one, you know, clearly indicates that tuberculosis remains one of the top uh, infectious killers, regardless of the current situation with COVID. Um, almost one and a half million people have died from TB each year uh, against a background of, of 10 million uh, new cases. So it's still a disease that's been around a long time uh, and it's likely to stay uh, for some time as well. Next slide, please. 
And in terms of where we're going, and I guess this will be more of a discussion for this afternoon, is that unusually for an infectious disease, we, we have um, a meeting of the UN General Assembly, which essentially endorsed the global strategy called End TB um, back in 2018. And so that is our, our route map um, for what we're doing overall in tuberculosis. Uh, next slide, please. And the particular part that of the end TB strategy that I'm going to be talking about is, is this particular pillar. Uh, it's the uh, early diagnosis of TB, including uh, drug susceptibility testing, etc. So it's the diagnosis um, of TB. Next slide, please. So this is a, a summary of, of the whole um, presentation in essence. Um, I'll be flipping back and forth between the use of these materials and markers, biomarkers, for diagnosis of TB. Uh, and that's mainly a focus around the urine side. Um, and prognosis, the ability to show that a person is cured from TB. Um, and that will be urine, but, but mainly um, plasma. Uh, blood samples in essence. Um, I'm going to be talking about an initial um, study which is how we, we, we started in, in this area, um, then talk a little bit further about larger cohorts of patients and samples that were collected in Lithuania and Arhangelsk and I'm thankful to our colleagues um, in both countries um, who've had to do this while um, the Covid uh, situation has been going on. Um, and then just discuss some of the results um, that we've got from our initial uh, uh, analysis and some of the um, presum presumptive markers and hopefully show you how we're, we're uh, trying to identify useful markers for both diagnosis and useful markers for prognosis, uh, the fact that you're cured. Next slide, please. Now, if you work in other areas, it, it sort of seems odd that we, you know, we find it difficult to know, in a sense, when you finished your treatment. We, we tend to use a basket of measures, um, clinical improvement, etc. But we do actually have a, a very old biomarker, which is um, bacteriological culture conversion from the phlegm um, that patients cough up uh, for, uh, when, when asked to do so. And that's been a pretty good marker, um, for example, at two months of treatment. And as you know, for drug sensitive TB, we, we give a standard six month course of tuberculosis therapy. But those have usually been pretty good, that where you've got culture conversion at two months, it's a pretty good indicator that the patient is going to do well later. For multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, which is particularly prominent in the European uh, WHO region, we, we're, we don't have a lot of TB in the European region, but we do have a lot of multi-drug resistant TB. Um, and in those studies, again, the two month um, biomarker was not as good um, and a six month uh, cutoff point was, was arguably significantly better. But still, there was room for improvement. And often you, you really want an earlier uh, marker that the patient is not doing as well or, or is in fact on the correct therapy uh, than we have at the moment. Now, in terms of new bio biomarker developments in the last 10 years, there have been a lot of um, possibilities proteomics, transcriptomics, we're focusing very much on metabolomics, one particular type of biomarker, particularly around the lipid section of metabolomics. Next slide, please. The pathway for this is to collect the sample, whether in this case urine or plasma, there's a, a sample preparation. There is a, an expensive instrument analysis. And again, I want to make this clear. Um, these instruments are high cost. This is not a low cost um, assay at this point. Um, there's a variety of pre-processing and analytical stages. And then we, we make our, our biological interpretation. Next slide, please. So what you get um, when you have a, a, a mass spectrometry and, and also next slide, please, Francesca, they'll, they'll come together. Thank you. And what you see is a very complex 3D image here. And in essence, every sample that we look at, we, we essentially are looking at around 50,000 biological markers or compounds and trying to assess whether they're, they're useful. So diagnostically, we want to see them in the TB samples, but not in any of the controls or in the, the pneumonias or in the urinary tract infections, etc. And for prognosis, we want markers that are found at the beginning of TB and consistently change either upwards or downwards um, over time in line with, uh, with the patient's cure or, or lack of cure. So um, all, of the mess all of the assays that I'm going to be describing are liquid chromatography mass spectrometry type assays with different ways of analyzing the metabolites that, that come through. Next slide, please. 
So at the simplest, what we did was a, was a very simplistic principal component analysis um, of a small group of TB patients versus healthy controls and urinary infections. And we did just one type of, <clears throat> of liquid chromatography uh, analysis. And what you see here is that what you want to see here is that the healthy controls, which are the red spots, um, are separate from the blues, which are the TBs, and, and indeed uh, they are um, on the left. And then on the right, um, obviously, if you have another infection, in this case, pyelonephritis in the urine, um, you don't really want that to interfere with a TB um, uh, diagnostic assay in the urine. And again, you can see that the TB is, is pretty well separated uh, from the uh, urinary tract infection uh, fingerprints. And then the next slide. And again, comparing TB versus other pulmonary infections, you again, you don't want your assay fooled by simple you know, pneumonia or other chest infections. You want it to be precise for TBs. So next slide, please. So after a variety of um, uh, modeling and, and manipulations, I won't go into all of that, we don't have time. Um, what we were able to do is train a model that was able to distinguish the four disease states, healthy, healthy, healthy controls, um, TB, pulmonary infection, and pyelonephritis. Now, let's be clear, what, we, what, what, what could we see at this point? What we're looking at are fingerprints. We don't know what the fingerprint is. What we can say is that we have fingerprints that distinguish these four disease states. So if you like, if you're looking at an ocean and you saw something red in the distance, you could see it was red, it was consistently red, it's always in the same position in the sea, but is it a red boat? Or is it a red ball? Or is it somebody in a red swimsuit? You don't know, but what you do know is there's a consistent signal of the same size, the same um, speed, etc., always there. So next slide, please. So what we've then moved on in this project was essentially to use a, a, both a previous longitudinal cohort that we had um, from a, an earlier EU-funded study um, and also <clears throat> develop um, further cohorts from Lithuania and Russia involving uh, more samples. Uh, again, with patients with TB, healthy um, urinary tract infection and other respiratory uh, infections. So overall, we've got a cohort of, of just under 400 patients uh, now and a biobank of urine samples um, kept at minus uh, 80 degrees with these disease states. So next, next slide, please. And, and so what do we do next? Well, we need to actually be able to quantify what the, the metabolite marker is. And that's not straightforward because you really want to know this so that you can use other assays and develop the next um, diagnostic system, the simpler one, the cheaper one. And for that, you have to obviously know what it is that you're looking at. You also need to have some measure of absolute quantification. We want to specify the cutoffs. In many cases, these metabolite markers are host markers, which will be there at a normal uh, an amount. And you want to know what that normal amount amount is and what, what is raised in TB and, and what, what is an appropriate fall. And that way, once you've got those, you can then check with future data, data sets. You can then run the assay uh, with an absolute quantification. Now, how do you do that? Well, you've got to then identify these biomarkers. Now, the first stage is to compare it with, with very large um, databases which are held globally. And these are simply a chemical with the, with the liquid chromatography and metabolite signature. And that's the simplest. The next step is then you buy that standard chemical once it's identified and you compare it with your metabolite to prove that it is, in fact, the same the same one. And then one of the problems is, is if you have a unique mark and we do have some some interesting new markers, you then have to have it synthesized because it will not be available um, locally. And then you need to have it isotopically labeled. And both of these processes can be incredibly slow and expensive. And as you'll see, we've been waiting for one isotopically labeled marker uh, for five months now because of the COVID situation. The organization that would produce it is not able to do that at the moment. And then once we've performed the calibration curves, we can relate um, the intensity with the ratio of both non-labeled and isotopically labeled um, compounds. We're able to then say, aha, this is the, this is the um, uh, biomarker. This is the, the range uh, of, of significance. Um, and you're, you know where you, where you stand. Uh, next slide, please. So this is an example um, of how we, and, and this is taken from urine, so this is used in diagnostic mode. And as you can see, every single sample that we, we have has been processed through three different um, liquid chromat chromatographic assay, assays. They're all reverse phase assays, um, but then the metabolites 
are acquired in what's called positive mode, negative mode, that's the first two, and then the, um, the third assay is a hydrophilic interactive chromatography, and then uh, metabolites are acquired in positive mode. Now that's rather a lot of words, and so it's easier just to talk about these assays as being RPOS, RNEG, and HPOS for that reason. And then they also undergo analysis using uh, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which picks up smaller compounds. And what you're looking for in an ideal marker is, is what's on the right. We do um, rock curves, and we look at the area under the curve as well. And what you want to see really is, a, is a, a, an AUC that's around 0 0.7, 0 0.8 or better when you compare your marker as found in TB patients with uh, all of your controls. And you do these in, in, in pairwise steps. So TB plus healthy, TB plus UTI, TB plus pneumonia. And you may find that some markers are very good at separating TB from healthy, but can't separate from other chest diseases. So we, we go through a process of removing um, uh, feature by feature, metabolite by metabolite, starting from 50,000 and working our way down to a smaller number of several hundred and then picking the best ones from that. Next slide. Um, so this gives you an idea of, of that process. This was comparing that first study I mentioned, the very small one, with the first um, samples that we got from Lithuania. Um, the Lithuanian uh, uh, set was slightly biased again because of COVID. Um, most of the samples were TB and healthy controls with relatively few samples from elsewhere, from, from, from the other uh, illnesses. And when we actually go through this process, iterative process, you eventually end up with a much smaller number of markers that we find in, in multiple data sets doing the same thing, going in the same direction, as I've indicated here. So 97 in the RPOS uh, and 23 in the HPOS. Now, there are, uh, because these assays are so exquisitely sensitive, there are problems in the interpretation. Now, one I've mentioned, the identity is not always known. Um, this is a very simple you know, matter of numbers and a matter of what is in the global databases. But you may find molecules that you get very excited about, and then you realize that you've actually got a bias in your population. So cotinine, for example, shows up as a very, very good marker of tuberculosis, one of the best markers we've ever found. But for those of you who know a little bit of, of, of chemistry, cotinine is a breakdown product of cigarette smoking. So what we did is we found actually a lovely, a lovely bi biomarker for smokers. Not quite what we were looking for at that stage. Uh, another case, we found an, a, a range of, of uh, markers that were exquisitely uh, uh, specific, um, but we found that these, in fact, were unknown metabolites of the drug ethambutol. And that's because often patients will have had one day of TB therapy before the sample is taken. And these assays are so sensitive that it will have picked up at um, that point. Next slide, please. Uh, Francis, um, are you almost through? Yeah, getting there, almost through, yeah. Okay, thanks. Sure, and then what we've also tried to do is to look at what's in the global literature, and this slide pretty much captures what's in the urine global literature of previous biomarkers here. And then what we've done is compared each of these and looked for these specifically in our urine samples. Next slide, please. And what you can see, this is what ISA and the colleagues in the previous slide um, demonstrated um, prognostically as well as diagnostically, that there were a number of uh, biomarkers um, whose concentrations reliably changed over a period of time and that they could use as prognostic markers. And we've looked at these. Next slide. And there are two here uh, on example, one on the left, one on the right. And what you can see is that they, those two markers that were in the literature, we also find them in our samples. And obviously when two scientific groups uh, find the same thing, that is a strong evidence, stronger evidence that they are of significance. And so we've identified these two, um, these two chemicals. There's a pretty good uh, ROC curve, area under the curve, and you can see that, that they are promising markers. Next slide, please. Um, and so, as I mentioned, the, 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 um, we, we've got a series of, of processes that we undergo to identify these uh, uh, metabolites. Um, we're waiting for a number of radio-labeled materials, and we have our Russian uh, cohort of, of material waiting to be analyzed on the last day of June. Um, and half of these will be analyzed blind, and half will be used again as a further discovery set. Uh, next slide, please. And then moving to the plasma, just the last couple of slides, um, again, similar approach. You can see how we've done it. Same assays on the left. Uh, you can see the type of programs that are used to analyze the, the fingerprints on the right. 
Um, the top on XCMS is, is used for unknown metabolites, and Peak Panther is used for known metabolites. And again, we work our way down through a system, uh, looking at the prediction of response from MDR patients versus drug-sensitive patients. Next slide. Initially, we've looked at both cytokines and immunological marker molecules. We did this before, and we identified a number of these molecules, as you can see. Next slide, please. But we've also gone ahead and looked at using a variety of longitudinal analysis models to look at markers that change reliably over a period of time. And we've identified uh, several markers that fit that categorization using linear mixed effect model um, approach. And as you can see, most of these markers are in the same direction, either going all the way down or going all the way up over a six month period. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then from that, we've basically been looking at mapping the specific uh, differences between naught and six months. Um, we've validated the approach. We've identified uh, a range of markers that appear both in the urine and also in the plasma, which is quite attractive um, as, as joint markers. Uh, and then um, we, we are uh, about to finish that work and write that work up uh, in terms of those markers. Uh, next slide, please. And then just to thank everybody, um, I'm uh, apologetic to our Lithuanian colleagues, but I'm afraid their, their pictures arrived late. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, colleagues uh, in my team on the top right um, the, uh, and the top left uh, who've been working on this project and previous projects. On the bottom left, uh, uh, the team of people from Samara who um, produced one of the longitudinal cohorts. On the bottom right are the chromatography people who've done much of the work, um, uh, Gonzalo in the middle there. Uh, has done most of the bioinformatic work. And then the last slide should be our colleagues uh, in Arhangelsk. Uh, uh, Andre always looks very dapper in his bow tie. I love that bow tie. Uh, and Olga, who helped set up the study uh, on the left. And that's the dispensary, TB dispensary in Arhangelsk there. Uh, so thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Francis. And lovely to see all the pictures of the collaborators. Um, Julia, am I correct that there are no questions as of yet in the chat? Maybe they will appear later, so let's prolong our session. Okay, if there are no questions, I have one short question and then I think we should go to the next um, session. My question is, Francis, um, do you think that in the end there will be one marker that is good for diagnosis or for uh, predicting cure, or do you expect it will more be a combination of markers? I think it will be a combination. What we're looking for is a small number uh, of markers, and at the moment we have a lot of markers and a few very good candidates. We, we have around six to eight markers that are looking very promising, um, either for prognosis or for diagnosis, and at least three of them overlap could be used diagnostically or prognostically. Okay. Thank you. And I still don't see any questions in the chat. And then I think I'll hand over to my co-chair, uh, Piotr Jablonski, for, for introducing the next speaker. Piotr, the floor is yours. Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is an honor to be here today with Dr. Marijek van der Werf. Good morning, everybody. Uh, the next presentation will be made by Jan Heikendorf and Matthias Merkel from Research Center Boston. Uh, Dr. Heikendorf is the director of the Study Center for Rare Lung Diseases and the director of Endoscopy and Tuberculosis Ward in this medical center. He is a respiratory medicine specialist who is working in the field of personalized medicine to improve the future management of tuberculosis patients. I know him uh, personally since we first met in Germany and then in St. Petersburg, where he was an honored guest in our national conferences. He also gave a brilliant presentation at the EFTS annual meeting regarding to complex TB therapeutic treatment. Professor Merkel is a colleague at John, a scientific project manager at Research Center Warsaw. He is a researcher in the molecular and examination experimental mycobacterial, mycobacteriology group he is responsible for the characterization of tuberculosis strains coming from the Eastern European. Uh, his work is focused on the evolution and worldwide expansion of multi-drug uh, resistant tuberculosis strains and the translation of the next generation sequencing guided drug resistant predicting into routine diagnostic application for tuberculosis patients. So, uh, let's start, Jan. 
Thank you very much, Piotr, for the very kind uh, introduction. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes, okay. So yeah, again, thank you very much uh, also for the organizers uh, and uh, again for the very kind invitation uh, and um, introduction, Piotr. Um, yeah, I would like to present to you today the uh, results from our work package um, as far uh, or the current standing where we stand with uh, sequencing and data interpretation and how the future perspectives would look like. And I think uh, I would first of all like to bring uh, the, the whole concept uh, a bit in, uh, into, um, uh, to introduce to you the concept of precision medicine uh, in general for the treatment of uh, tuberculosis patients uh, and especially for MDR. TB patients and how that may look like in the future. And as uh, Francis already presented, there are um, several aspects uh, for uh, treatment monitoring. Uh, for example, this perspective of having um, treatment monitoring markers that could eventually also define um, individualized therapy durations, for example. And one major aspect that we were working uh, here uh, uh, on in this work package was um, the very early detection of um, drug resistances um, against um, anti-tuberculosis drugs and, and how to rapidly interpret them, um, how to, uh, and how to bring that to uh, clinicians that they may then uh, be able to conduct um, also tailored drug regimens. Um, and uh, we, the uh, idea was <clears throat> to use um, next generation sequencing methods uh, where we have uh, um, uh, the, the information from whole genome sequencing of the pathogen uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, where we then create a reference uh, mapping to detect then um, uh, variants uh, that may uh, um, code for drug resistances, for example, against rifampicin a very important first-line drug, or uh, isoniazid, then defining also MDR-TB, mm, uh, and then excluding certain um, drugs, but also maybe uh, predicting uh, drug susceptibility. So um, the information would be that we can use certain drugs. And also whole genome sequencing or next generation sequencing would enable um, also uh, epidemiologists to to derive phylogenetic uh, uh, variants and also to, to de detect low level resistances uh, that could then also uh, enable clinicians to adjust dosages to due to the low level resistance which were then detected here. Um, I will skip this here. So in the uh, recent um, past, there were also great efforts to, um, um, to pool data from large uh, uh, strain uh, um, banks around the world. And this, I think the, the most renowned one was the cryptic consortium where um, it was shown that whole genome sequencing would meet um, the WHO target product profiles to detect drug uh, susceptibility um, uh, against the most important um, first line drugs, rifampicin, isoniazid, ethambutol, and persinamide. Uh, uh, with uh, high uh, um, predictive uh, values uh, in terms of sensitivity, specificity, and positive and negative predictive values. So this also enforces or reinforces our thinking about this uh, topic. However, um, we have um, still open questions regarding the question, what is resistance in general? And on this graph, you can see on the y-axis the estimated distribution of strains that are being detected and on the uh, x-axis the minimum inhibitory concentration of these uh, strains and on the right hand side you would um, then find um, strains with high level drug resistance and on the left side then wild type or no drug resistance at all but we have uh, the problem of um, certain strains that are sort of in between that are not <clears throat> very well characterized by epidemiological cutoff values uh, and still these strains may be treated with um, uh, drugs uh, if you just increase the drug dosage for example 
And um, uh, we also in the past, together with Matthias and other colleagues, um, I, uh, try to characterize this finding. And uh, we believe that with in, in, uh, in the case of low level um, uh, drug resistance, there's still a chance to <clears throat> treat um, patients with the drugs uh, with low level, underlying low level uh, drug resistance. However, this needs to be better characterized. And also the WHO uh, uh, recognizes that um, the so-called uh, uh, phenotypic DST is not longer the um, gold standard. It's rather a combination of both molecular DST and phenotypic DST. Um, and um, uh, we still need to better characterize, to better understand these mutations or these strains that move between uh, the uh, um, uh, no drug resistance and all and high level drug resistance. Um, here, the uh, unknown mutations are probably the most difficult to characterize um, strains. And uh, in a recent publication also with colleagues here from uh, Borstel, we tried to analyze um, a large um, uh, cohort of or patients, uh, patient-derived samples, where we had um, extensive second-line drug resistance status uh, uh, and whole genome sequencing. And here, they were very easy to detect uh, drug resistances and others that were not easy to detect or where we had contradictions between next-generation sequencing results and the uh, culture, liquid culture midget uh, results. And uh, as you can see here, for example, we had contradictions between NGS and midget and 1.1%. And, uh, and, uh, um, and um, these are actually the problematic uh, strains where we don't know what to do and how to treat. So there's a, a need to better characterize um, these mutations. And um, also, this brings me to the next point, in the recent years and several or novel drugs against uh, 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 mycobacterium tuberculosis have been marketed and the most important one is bedaquiline, a uh, diarrheal uh, quinolone um, and it is already in group A for the treatment of MDR-TB so it's one of the most important drugs that we have in the fight against tuberculosis um, uh, next to uh, the fluoroquinolones and linezolid. Um, however, um, there's no commercial molecular DST uh, available at all, so we highly depend on culture testing, which is also not available uh, in, in a lot of um, high incidence countries. It's very difficult to detect um, uh, drug resistances here. And here also we need to A, improve our understanding regarding drug resistances because we already see that uh, it's not as easy as for rifampicin, for example, there are a high number of mutations that can code for drug resistance. And B, we need to bring this into uh, the clinics then, uh, ideally with a commercial test, uh, of course. We try to characterize um, uh, bedaquiline resistance in um, uh, and strains from Moldova, um, uh, together with uh, care collaborative partners um, from Moldova, um, and um, looked at strains that were uh, sampled um, before the introduction of bedaquiline to uh, the, the patient and then also looked at strains that were uh, exposed to bedaquiline uh, under treatment and uh, tried to see how bedaquiline resistance uh, would uh, uh, behave under treatment because there were findings that bedaquiline resistance would uh, emerge uh, under the treatment of uh, bedaquiline. And uh, however, we saw that um, uh, at least 15% of uh, strains treated with bedaquiline acquired um, uh, bedaquiline resistance uh, under treatment, which is a quite high number. Um, uh, we did this by identifying RV0678 and ATPE uh, uh, mutations. And we also looked at the cohort of patients that were treated here, and we've uh, found that um, especially cavitary disease and an insufficient backbone uh, treatment regimen were also um, associated with um, uh, negative treatment outcomes. Um, and uh, as you can see on the right-hand side, so uh, the higher the number of 
uh, uh, insufficient uh, drugs that were accompanying betacolin in the case of drug resistance, uh, the higher the uh, um, um, proportion of negative outcome would be, at least in this uh, uh, relatively small cohort of patients. Uh, however, we, we see that uh, we need a functional drug regimen that is accompanying uh, bedaquilin, and most importantly, we need molecular tests to detect, to early detect uh, drug resistances or drug resistance against bedaquilin. This now brings me to the next point. Um, as I have said in, in the first place, uh, our aim was to um, uh, create a rapid um, uh, interpretation method of uh, whole genome sequencing data. And together with colleagues from, from Tübingen, uh, um, Bernhard Reuter and uh, Nico Pfeiffer, and also from Cologne, Rolf Kaiser, we, um, uh, we created um, uh, machine learning uh, algorithms or trained machine learning algorithms, namely random forest and Boolean compressing sensing uh, to um, interpret whole genome sequencing data to predict drug resistance and drug susceptibility. We did this uh, mainly with around uh, uh, with the information from publicly available data, uh, around 15,000 uh, strains also uh, with available culture, phenotypic DST for these uh, for, for important second line and first line drugs. And we aligned that with mutation catalogs, with very uh, up-to-date mutation catalogs that came from uh, Borstel and divided uh, these uh, uh, numbers or these strains into training and uh, prediction data sets that were then later aligned with uh, the gold standard uh, culture in this case. And um, uh, yeah, we, we are quite confident that we at least have uh, methods that could work um, by using um, these uh, machine learning uh, algorithms to predict uh, drug uh, resistances here. You can see on the uh, x-axis uh, important um, uh, drugs against uh, tuberculosis, for example, amikacin, cyclozarin, also the fluoroquinolones, uh, and rifampicin also. Um, why not the others? Why not bedaquilin, for example? Um, the problem is that we simply don't have the phenotypic data to align this, so it may be possible to also use um, these methods and then later train them to other second-line drugs, but at the moment we're not able to do that, uh, at least with these high numbers, uh, uh, as in this example. And you can see that the sensitivity here, uh, in comparison to the, <clears throat> uh, uh, um, to the mutation catalog of two um, machine learning algorithms that were uh, trained here, Random Forest and the Boolean, uh, were at least as high as the catalog, um, or in some cases even higher. And if you compare that to already published um, methods uh, um, that were published in 2019 and 21, uh, we are also at least as good as their performances in terms of sensitivity. And um, the same applies to uh, specificity, uh, where we are even better in some cases, for example, in the case of ethionamide, and also uh, for the uh, specificity uh, uh, in uh, comparison to other published um, models or other published um, uh, data sets. So what, what is the next step? We need to translate um, these, uh, the, this method basically to um, the uh, um, uh, creation of, uh, of tailored drug regimens, basically, um, that uh, then can be used uh, by clinicians in the field. Uh, we've already created a, a matrix um, in a publication in uh, 2018 and also uh, in, uh, now this year, uh, which could be used to um, then create uh, drug re uh, regimens based on, on the predictions of uh, the machine learning algorithm methods. Uh, which could then be uh, translated to a web tool, which is currently uh, under preparation. Uh, and ideally, we would <clears throat> then have a situation where uh, whole genome sequencing data would be introduced to this web tool. Uh, drug resistance or drug susceptibility uh, results would be uh, created or interpreted, <clears throat> and clinicians would also be given then a tailored drug regimen, at least uh, uh, something that could be uh, done. I think um, this is a general 
um, uh, task for the future also to have these high um, uh, um, these these high throughput uh, methods also for example uh, characterized by Francis and then uh, how to bring this into the field how to treat p patients in high incident settings where also we have the situation of low resources uh, this is one of the major uh, um, uh, obstacles that we have to deal with right now um, and, and I think that is the main task for the near future yeah and now in summary we have um, uh, created uh, or we have sequenced uh, strains from Moldova that have been treated also with bedacoline during the last years uh, we are trying to derive population genomics and the resistance evolution also over time. Also, uh, comparison of bedacoline, pre bedacoline uh, periods with post bedacoline periods. We are also in close contact with uh, our colleagues in St. Petersburg. Uh, I think we will uh, hear the results in one of the next sessions from Ekaterina. And um, as I just tried to, uh, to introduce to you, we, will, we are uh, currently working on the Gino Tofino app to bring our findings into clinical reality. And with this, I would like to thank, thank you, uh, all the collaborative partners. Uh, it is a pleasure to work with you, um, to be part of this uh, great consortium. Uh, I really enjoyed the face-to-face -face meetings in Rome uh, and in Moscow. Uh, it was just a pleasure and I hope that we will be able to meet again after the whole COVID misery is over. Thank you very much. Thank you, yeah, thank you very much for a very informative presentation and impressions. Thank you. Uh, what about questions, dear colleagues? You can put it, uh, them in the chat. Are there any? Mm, Francesca asked, will you use the three methods together? Uh, I, yes, I wanted to break yeah. the, 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 the glass <laughs> and make a first question. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jan, for, for your wonderful presentation. And uh, you mentioned three different uh, machine learning approaches and uh, compared their uh, efficacy and sensitivity. And uh, is there any... Um, uh, vision that you, uh, together with uh, Tubingen, uh, will try to combine these methods to get a better, an even better prediction system. Yeah, I think that is one possibility. Um, um, uh, I think it, it would be even better if the uh, different methods would uh, lead to very similar conclusions. Um, so that you would have an internal validation that would be created by both methods or all the methods that are available uh, that could be then stated in the report uh, given to, to our clinicians. But of course, we can also try to um, combine that. But ideally, I think it would be good to have different results that, uh, of these different methods that, are then, uh, that have the same results. It is not question, but remark, it could be very expensive. What do you think about that? Well, whole genome sequencing, I, I, it is a bit problematic because the, um, the materials that are needed uh, have different costs around the world. So um, again, it is quite unfair, I think, because whole genome sequencing in, in Germany, for example, is not that expensive anymore um, to, uh, to perform. Uh, whole genome sequencing costs less than 100 euros, sometimes even only 50 euros without personnel, I would say. Um, but in other countries, the costs are uh, very, very high. So that is a problem. It's absolutely true. So um, as long as the costs for whole genome sequencing are not uh, equally distribu distributed across the world, um, uh, it's, it's not possible in all areas of the world. Can I make a comment, Peter? Yeah, please. Um, I think one thing to ask to Jan for, uh, to explain, which is important to understand the um, for what is actually the sensitivity. 
So if I understand it correctly, Jan, the sensitivity are those that are either double positive or double negative. So where the genotype predicts the phenotypic result of being positive correctly, plus the group of those that are genotypically predicted to be resistant correctly. And that's that adds up to all of those that have the, the, the sensitivity. And if you take all of the patients, just the sensitivity, let's say the method has a sensitivity for a drug of 80%, then 20% are mismatches. And I think it's important to highlight a bit on these mismatches because many of these mismatches are actually plausible. They are either, either and, and this is very important for the message, but I, I'll, I don't want to explain, and I'd uh, like to give you the, the opportunity to explain that what, what is actually, what are those that are not captured by that sensitivity? Well, um, as I, um, so the, the, the problem is, I, I showed you that in the beginning of the presentation, um, there are uh, several cases where we have unknown mutations or mutations that are not uh, well characterized. Uh, and um, especially these unknown mutations or mutations that are somehow where we don't know if they code for low level or high level resistances. Uh, those are the, the uh, cases where we have mismatches and uh, also where we don't have a proper catalog uh, to, to tell us uh, what is true and what is not true. And obviously, if, you don't, if we miss the gold standard information, we can't um, say anything uh, about the uh, uh, performance of our test because we simply don't know what is, what is true. Yeah. But it also may be that the, uh, because we, we usually get from the microbiology lab a result that is binary. It, it tells us it's susceptible or resistant. We don't get an MIC related to the result as we may get for other bacteria on standard. And it looks currently as if there are several low level resistances that are not being picked up by the phenotypic binary testing, but where there is already a degree of resistance present that are identified by um, the genotypic method. And they go into that group that is not captured by the sensitivity because they, they have mismatch results. And it is probably, it is important to know better, to have a better understanding in the future, what do these low level resistances actually mean in terms of treatment? Can we overcome them by giving more drugs, like like increasing the the drug dosage to overcome the resistance, or is the and and, and how how should that be handled, or should patients not receive any uh, drugs if there is low level resistance predicted? Yes. Thank you, Christoph. Uh, uh, dear colleagues, uh, we have ten minutes for the break, but maybe uh, Francesca, we have. Uh, I need your advice. Maybe we could prolong our session. According to our program, now we have a break. Uh, yes, uh, do we have more questions? Yeah, please. I, I see one question from Rolf. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, Jan, uh, very good presentation. Thank you. Uh, some questions that have come up um, uh, lead to our experience from HIV and hepatitis resistance testing. Definitely, um, sequencing is somewhat digital, so you have the mutation or not. Uh, this is um, so far easy to judge. But uh, what you were referring to um, uh, was the clinical cutoff of, of this uh, mutation and the prediction of the phenotypic uh, or phenotypic resistance um, uh, predicted by the sequence. This is uh, either um, to be correlated to the phenotypic um, correlate or to a clinical outcome. So this is what we also discussed. And I think uh, so far, uh, like in HIV, we go for the worst case scenario. That means exclude uh, drugs, possibly drugs which are not safe. And uh, this is exactly what, what you uh, addressed is our future work. 
to uh, predict uh, the um, resistance by these new tools faster and more precisely and um, accessible to um, most uh, most relevant um, uh, working groups. So, and we would like to introduce our knowledge and experience from HIV and hepatitis resistance. So this is, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Rolf. I, I absolutely agree. I think uh, also the, the experience that you have from uh, Gino Tofino for hep, hep C and, and HIV is just um, yeah, uh, priceless because we, we can, uh, if we collaborate, if we further collaborate in, in this field, it can really uh, have a huge impact for, uh, for uh, patients in the future, for uh, the management of our patients. Um, so thank you very much for that comment. It's, uh, I absolutely agree. Thank you. Uh, I couldn't see other questions, so you have to stop this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Francesca, I want to ask you, uh, shall we make a break or not? Maybe we could present next presentation. I think we are still uh, uh, lively enough uh, and we can uh we can proceed to the next presentation. So we have some minutes more maybe for, uh, the discussion. for discussion. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank so you. The next presentation uh, will be reported by Ekaterina Chernyaeva and Mikhail Rodkevich. Uh, Ekaterina Chernyaeva has graduated from St. Petersburg State University, Faculty of Biology, Speciality Biologist. She's a very inspired scientist in clinical microbiology and infectious diseases. She has won and lead a few remarkable grants concerning search for new genetic marks of mycobacterium, including mycobacterium tuberculosis. She created a database of genomic variation of clinical strains of mycobacterial tuberculosis, uh, combining genomic microbiological clinical data on strains and their geographical distribution. Mikhail Rodkevich also graduated from St. Petersburg University, now working as a researcher in the Dobrzhansky Center for Genome uh, Bioinformatics, a talented mathematician specialized in genome sequencing, data analysis. He devoted a lot of time researching uh, the genome wide analysis of mycobacterium tuberculosis. So, Ekaterina, your presentation is ready. Please. Okay. Uh, yeah, my presentation, uh, I, I, Francesca, you please share because there are some troubles with Google Meet. I cannot share my desktop. Is it possible? Francesca, could we help take it in? Yes, I'm I'm opening the presentation. Huh? Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, just make it just Can you see it? Yeah, uh, I think everyone can see it because I can see it as well. Uh, so the presentation is actually, uh, uh, I will represent the results that we achieved during this uh, grant uh, and collaboration. Uh, please, next slide. So there are two, uh, two subjects uh, that we, uh, two, two, two Two group of results that we have performed. So the first uh, part of the research uh, that we have finished during this care project is was the analysis of our uh, previously collected data set. Uh, it's a uh, whole genome sequencing of pulmonary and extrapulmonary TB samples that were collected from patients with uh, uh, in Russia, and that they were collected uh, at the Institute of Ophthysia Pulmonology in Saint Petersburg. 
so we wanted to run the com comparative analysis of the genome and to identify major mutations known to be associated with drug resistance to the first and second line uh, of uh, anti-B drugs to see uh, the prevalence of different previously described mutations. Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, so uh, the, here is uh, our material. So we had uh, 72 pulmonary and 73 extra pulmonary TB samples uh, with a well characterized uh, with uh, microbiological uh, data. Uh, some of them were collected from HIV infected people. It was just 25, but still we used this uh, information on, in our analysis. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, and so we have uh, uh, performed whole genome sequencing uh, uh, of uh, DNA extracted from uh, TB cultures, uh, performed uh, alignment and uh, SNV and indels identification, performed phylogenetic analysis. Uh, so we run polygotyping for TB classifications. Uh, I mean, it was just digital polygotyping, of course, and statistical analysis. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, here are results uh, of our uh, phylogenetic analysis. So, uh, what we expected, uh, we, uh, as we expected, we have identified a lot of samples that were, uh, belong to Beijing group. This is lineage too, it's a main, main group of, of uh, isolates belong to this group. So, there was a small relatively small group uh, of uh, different clades that belong to lineage 4. On the slide you can see uh, where the gray dots and pink dots, this is uh, information about the diagnosis. So gray dots is a pulmonary TB samples and uh, pink dots uh, extra pulmonary TB and also profiles of drug resistance. They're marked with the MDR, pre MDR with a pre-XDR, just that will become very soon XDR, XDR samples, uh, mono-resistant and susceptible. Uh, so uh, here we can see that, uh, as it was expected, the, uh, be, uh, so the, it was maybe not so much expected, but, but it was a previously, previously described that extrapulmonary tuberculosis uh, more oftenly belongs to Beijing group and we have actually seen it and uh, this group is uh, more often has uh, multiple drug resistance. Uh, next slide please. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so we also run the genome-wide association for to find if we can find any mutations um, associated with the diagnosis and uh, the analysis was performed, uh, we ex excluded uh, Include specific SNPs and then uh, for the rest of SNPs we run a Fisher exact test and using this approach we didn't find any associations uh, and uh, so we can say that there were no any significant markers that can say what uh, predict what kind of um, beside uh, beside uh, phylogenetic markers of course um, that can predict what type of uh, disease could be developed uh, for each strain next slide please uh, he, this slide shows uh, that um, yeah the slide shows uh, the picture uh, the profiles of drug resistance uh, the comparative analysis of pulmonary and extrapulmonary TB samples so extrapulmonary TB samples are more often uh, characterized by multiple and extra uh, and uh, XDR TB uh, and uh, here's also the small snapshot of uh, drug resistance in different uh, genetic lineages that we have found and that also characterizes that uh, Beijing strains more often have uh, drug re multiple and, uh, and, X X X and XDRTB. Next slide. Uh, so, um, we also looked uh, through specific mutations that are associated with drug resistance uh, that were previously described. 85% uh, of an INH resistance strains carried mutation in, uh, very well known in KG gene. Uh, 96 um, strains with rifampicin resistance had a mutation in RPOB. 
over uh, 98 uh, streptomycin resistant acylates had mutations that uh, uh, are previously described that associated to the, uh, the, uh, the resist streptomycin resistance. It was previously shown that mutations in the regulatory region of, of uh, the uh, YB7 gene can uh, indirectly influence on canamycin resistance, but in our uh, work it was not shown. Uh, we uh, suppose that this mutation more likely associated with streptomycin resistance. Uh, Ofloxacin resistant had mutations, uh, strains had mutations in GRA, GRB and genes that were previously described. Uh, so uh, the same situation is uh, with the EMBB gene. It's also uh, um, most of resistant strains had mutations uh, in EMBB uh, region among the tambutol resistant strains. Um, and uh, we also looked through mutations that were in PNC and PSA gene that were previously described and there were a lot of different works with detailed uh, description of mutations uh, associated with pyrazinamide resistance. So we found the uh, previously described mutation among 67% uh, of PZA resistant um, strains, but some of them were also uh, susceptible also had uh, these mutations uh, and it's actually well uh, described in our publications so and available in the supplementary material. Uh, please, next slide. Uh, so, uh, concerning HIV co-infection, uh, we also, uh, it was not, uh, we didn't have so many HIV positive uh, uh, patients with tuberculosis included in our uh, in our work but still we have found some association with um, with the influence of HIV infection on the development of extrapulmonary TB in case of uh, Beijing strains um, next slide please so uh, the, the okay the first summary of the of the results you can see on this slide so we have found that extrapulmonary tuberculosis uh, more often belong to genetic uh, to Beijing genetic group than uh, pulmonary tuberculosis uh, analysis of mutation associated with bacterial resistance to first and second line TB drugs allowed to identify that relatively high proportion of uh, uh, is an isotrifampicin, uh, streptomycin, and afloxacin resistant isolate had standard SNPs uh, uh, that uh, were previously described and predictive for drug resistance. Uh, so uh, mutations in PNC and RPSA genes that were known to be involved in the development of PZA uh, were identified, of course, and uh, most of PZA resistant isolates had mutation in PNCA gene. Um, uh, so, and um, however, we detected few mutations that were mentioned as associated with resistance among susceptibles, uh, PZA susceptibles isolates. Uh, detection of mutations associated with drug resistance among susceptible isolates may indicate the presence of low number of drug resistant clones uh, in a population and might be a signal for uh, correction for TB therapy in case it was developed in base of phenotypic data. Maybe it was the same case as, a, uh, for example, a, a low concentration uh, of uh, inhale. I mean, uh, uh, that was Jan uh, was previously talking about about uh, um, low concentration of, in, in, uh, of, of low level of resistance. And um, yeah, another one uh, uh, conclusion is HIV infection increases the probability of tuberculosis, uh, generalization of tuberculosis, of active uh, extrapulmonary tuberculosis. So the, uh, next slide, please. So the second uh, part of our work is, was the development of a tool uh, that allows to run uh, uh, whole, uh, whole genome sequencing data to identify new mutations and new markers associated with drug resistance. So we develop a, a phylogenetic convergence tool and here is a li uh, link to the GitHub so we can actually uh, try to test it as, as well as we did. Uh, please, next slide. So the basic uh, the basics of this method was previously described in Nature uh, paper, and uh, we tried to develop this um, 
uh, to implement this uh, method in, in a tool. So, uh, so basically, the, uh, this slide shows that there are there, there exist different um, mechanisms of the development of drug resistance. It's a horizontal gene transfer uh, recombination and uh, recurrent mutations, but in um, um, mycobacterium tuberculosis, only one of these three mechanisms are working, so we can just test for recurrent mutations and find new genomic associations with any type of phenotypes. One of them could be, for example, drug resistant, or there could also be diagnosis and so many other features. Uh, please, next slide. So we implemented this approach and developed the pipeline and tool, uh, the CONFI tool that uh, uh, all takes uh, as an input data phylogenetic tree, a uh, list of SNPs, it's, uh, which you can t obtain just after alignment of a whole genome sequencing data and binary phenotypes. So uh, if you have information about for, for the uh, for, for a part of the population, you have information about uh, the drug resistance, for example, you just can upload this in data and use them in, uh, in, uh, in this pipeline. And permutation test also allows you to get the information about the significance of which mutations that could be associated with the, any phenotype, or, for example, drug resistance. Next slide, please. So we uh, uh, also, for, for this, uh, we developed the tool and uh, performed the testing of this tool with uh, our own data. Uh, so in this, uh, and uh, publicly available data. Now, what I mean about our own data, it's um, for over 400 uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis sequences that we uh, uh, collected previously and during this uh, care project because during this care project we performed whole genome sequencing of 150 samples and uh, all of the samples were characterized with the microbiological data and we could use them for, for testing of our new tool. And we also used the Chinese uh, um, isolates that were published uh, and uh, information about drug resistance was also included into uh, in, in this pipeline. So we a little bit changed our analysis of whole genome sequencing data. We changed the uh, alignment method uh, uh, and uh, variant calling method because we uh, uh, made the comparative analysis and decided that uh, this uh, pipeline should work better. So here is described what type of information did we had and what kind of, um, uh, uh, of uh, what analytical tools we, we used for this analysis. Uh, next slide, please. So the results here uh, is represented here. It's a big uh, phylogenetic tree uh, that contain uh, that was built uh, based on uh, 827 isolates, the majority of them belong to um, Beijing group lineage 2. It's uh, marked with green and uh, and uh, different types. So, so some of these subgroups are, are marked with uh, yellow and let's say hockey and dark blue, uh, dark green. Um, so this uh, phylogenetic tree was built on over 4,000 concatenated SNPs, and uh, so please next slide. And uh, so uh, the result of this uh, uh, of this uh, uh, tool that we used for the analysis is actually a very long list of uh, SNPs that. Uh, uh, are have some uh, statistical significance that are associated with drug resistance and uh, soon is it's very difficult to show it here because it's a long uh, list of markers that have to be analyzed each of them have to be analyzed uh, individually so uh, as a result we can say that confi demonstrated high level of concordance with association described in chinese validation as uh, we said data set uh, we also looked for association with the uh, pulmonary extra pulmonary localization and uh, so there were some uh, few, uh, several markers found in ppp genes uh, that um, 
uh, are associated with uh, TB localization, with extrapulmonary tuberculosis. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, concerning the mutations associated with drug resistance, we also found a long list of uh, mutations and uh, uh, of course, we all, these mutations like uh, CAT gene mutation, RPOB, uh, GRA, GRB, they were also identified as significant, but also there was a long list of other mutations that are associated with the, all 11 uh, TB drugs that were included in this um, analysis. Uh, some of them, are, uh, for example, were found in the 6 v in PKS12, LPPA, PPB, some of these mutations also say, are working, uh, are included into cell wall uh, uh, metabolism, metabolism, some of these mutations associated with uh, uh, it's a kind of inter, uh, uh, antigens of uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, so it has to be more deeply analyzed further. Uh, please, next slide. Mm -hmm. So, and as a summary of the whole work, so we performed analysis uh, and uh, whole genome sequencing and analysis of um, uh, 150 new MDR strains. So we, they were sequenced uh, in, uh, in the university. Uh, so we performed, uh, based on whole genome sequencing data, we performed analysis of mutations associated with drug resistance in new data and previously collected uh, uh, with new data and previously collected strains. Uh, so we developed a tool for convergence SNV, uh, um, uh, 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 convergent SNPs identifications uh, uh, to identify genome associations and tested them on a big data set over 800 um, genomes. Uh, so, and this uh, tool allowed us to identify new SNVs associated with uh, drug resistance and TB localization for further detailed analysis. So yeah, so the next slide is uh, our acknowledgement. So we would, uh, would like to uh, say thank you for the, uh, for the funding and to, for Scientific Research Center uh, this, uh, that uh, allows, uh, helped us to sequence, uh, whole genome, uh, to run whole genome sequencing of our TB strains. Thank you for the attention. Piotr, you're muted. Yeah, thank you, Vasetka. Thank you very much, Katrina, for this excellent presentation. Uh, we can, uh, we can, uh, some questions, please. Um, as of now, I don't see any questions in the chat, and I also don't see any hands. So um, I take the liberty of asking the first question in the hope that others will come later. Uh, Ekaterina, thank you for the nice presentation. Can you tell us what the next steps will be in this uh, nice piece of work? Uh, so the, the further is a more detailed analysis of new SNPs and the validation, of course. So this will be the, the next step. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, I couldn't see any question. So, Marieke, is your turn, please? Yeah. Um, my proposal is that we take a short break to stretch the legs, go to the bathroom, take a coffee, and if you're very quick, you can do all three of those. Um, and that we are back at 10.30, and then we start with the next presentation. So take a few minutes to uh, get out of your chair, and I'll see you back at 10.30. Or it's probably another time for those who are not in my time zone. Sorry. Okay, let me ch check whether the next speaker, Sesha, is back in the meeting. Sesha, can you show yourself? Yes. Yeah, yes. good. So that doesn't withhold us from starting then. Thanks. Yes. Okay, I will introduce you and then we start with um, your presentation. So the next in this session will be by Sesha Venka Tesvaran. Um, he is a chemical engineer with a PhD, PhD in materials and polymer science. 
and he has a lot of experience in a variety of industri industrial and academic settings in India, in the UK, in Spain and other European countries. He is passionate about frugal diagnostics and is part of three such multilateral projects, including the Arrest TB project, of which he is the coordinator. And uh, he will talk to us about the importance of collaborations for accurate, rapid, robust and economical diagnostic technologies for tuberculosis. Uh, Sesha, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Right. Can you see the slides in the, in the full screen more? It's not in full screen. Can you see the slides? No. We could see the slides, but not in the full screen mode. Sorry. One second. Sorry about that. I made a mistake. Just try again, and I'll tell you when it's in full screen mode. Right. Can you see it now? Not yet. I think you. Yeah, now it's coming. Yes, now, it's now it's coming. Okay. Yeah. okay well, well, thank you for uh, the invitation to present in this meeting. Actually, so uh, I'll start with a couple of things uh, before I start the presentation. Um, I mean, firstly, apologies for this somewhat uh, untidy appearance. Uh, I'm working from currently from a small town in India, uh, <coughs> helping some hospital, <coughs> helping uh, some hospitals in this uh, COVID crisis. So I've been a victim of uh, some extended lockdowns here and I have less means to make myself look smart. Sir. Um, secondly, I think the internet here is not a little bit uh, unreliable. So I'd probably like to switch off the uh, video during the presentation, just in case it gets uh, stuck during, during my talk. So, uh, Okay. Okay. So, um, so my name is Sesha actually, and I'm the project coordinator for RSTB. Uh, and uh, uh, given the time limit, I'll try to stick to the title and give an overview of the project and how collaborations have helped us. Um, I'm also glad that we've been a bit lenient with the, the time uh, so far uh, in, in general. So today, I'll talk about uh, the goals of RSTV and how the collaborations in the context of uh, uh, countries, people, and institutes have helped us uh, to achieve uh, at least partly what we intended to achieve. So this, this slide, uh, the goals of RSTV, is probably the most important slide of this presentation. Uh, in RSTV, we, we aim to develop a range of affordable uh, diagnostic devices um, uh, in particular, you know, we want them to be low cost. Uh, at the same time, we want it to be reliable uh, and which can be used with minimal training and, 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 and expertise. Uh, the vision actually is to, is to move away from uh, centralized uh, testing uh, and to be able to uh, enable testing of uh, TB in field, by which we mean that uh, uh, we are able to uh, take the testing to the field rather than people having to uh, come to centralized locations for getting tested. Um, and this coupled with, uh, 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 with cloud-based uh, notification and ensuring public, which will enable uh, public health intervention and, uh, and surveillance uh, interventions. So uh, coming to the collaborations, I believe that uh, we've been lucky in RSDP to have a balanced partnership not only as required by the co-funding mechanism with, uh, with tick boxes to ensure so many countries and, and partners are required, etc., but also in a practical way, uh, which uh, embraces uh, uh, kind of world-class researches from, from uh, uh, and, and commercial partners from Italy, Spain, and UK, uh, and also from uh, uh, Russia and India. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, unlike in some other projects, uh, we do have the Indian partner who, who enables, uh, um, you know, additional inputs in terms of diversity and also brings in 
unique perspectives uh, in terms of uh, uh, deploying these devices in, in a limited resources environment, which is crucial for the project. Uh, so in terms of people, the project has employed uh, 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 people from a variety of, uh, of, uh, of skills. So it brings together uh, kind of routine users of uh, TB diagnostics with, uh, with, uh, with clinicians, biologists, chemists, physicists, and engineers from, from, from various disciplines uh, with the skills to design, build, and, uh, uh, and develop uh, uh, new tools and technologies, uh, uh, which I'll hopefully be able to show you during the course of the presentation. So during the course of the project, we have been able to travel uh, across uh, to various partner institutions. Uh, we had meetings in the EU, in the, in the UK, uh, in, in Russia, we had uh, a meeting. Also, uh, we've been uh, uh, to India. Uh, the, the Russian partner have been to the, to the UK, and we have been to, to, to Russia, so on and so forth. Uh, so, hopefully, these these uh, these interactions uh, um, have helped us, uh, um, you know, to to to, to, to develop uh, a long term partnership and, and uh, potentially, you know, good friendships too. So this is a, a, a workshop that we conducted between uh, University of Edinburgh and, and uh, the National Institute of Research in Tuberculosis in, in, in India. Um, and this invited about 50 participants from both UK and India, where we were able to exchange uh, 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 ideas and, and, and uh, knowledge. Um, at the same time, you know, it hopefully have enabled uh, uh, further collaborations and, and new bridges being built between uh, uh, between various uh, uh, academicians as well as the industry people who, who attended the workshop. So this was before COVID and uh, uh, it was in July 2019. So coming to how the collaborations have actually enabled to achieve the goals that I kind of uh, uh, elucidated in, in, in the first slide, I'll now take you through products that we've developed and how they were driven by collaborations. This is a summary of test that we've developed uh, uh, during the course of the project. Uh, so uh, first is the sputum-based screening, screening, where uh, we have developed some specific dyes uh, that are specific to, to mycobacterium. Uh, uh, so this will uh, uh, enable uh, re reduction of the number of washing steps that uh, is required for the standard uh, sputum smear microscopy. So hopefully the specificity and sens sensitivity of these tests are improved. And secondly, we also developed the molecular tests, uh, which I'll show you uh, uh, in the next couple of slides. Uh, probably a little bit uh, uh, risky element of the project is, is actually the uh, microRNA based biomarkers for TB, uh, which uh, uh, and tests for these, uh, uh, and in particular, looking at uh, uh, microRNA signatures for latent, active, latent TB and active TB. So, coming to the products, this is the first product that uh, we've developed. Uh, so this uh, this is a uh, uh, this, this we call it as a spin tube, uh, which allows a rapid telemetric test and a visual identification of uh, of uh, TB and NTM infections. Um, so these are spin tubes the size of uh, one mil ependoff. Uh, so uh, they contain these pro probes that are specific for either uh, the mycobacterium uh, species in as a whole or or uh, are specific to the TB bacteria. Uh, so if M appears, it's just a, uh, uh, potentially just an NTM infection. And if M and T appear together, then it's a, it's a TB. And if no, uh, none of, if neither M or T appears, then it's, a, uh, then it's, a, it, it's neither mycobacterial infection or a TB infection. So this kind of allows a very clear visual examination of, uh, of the test. And, uh, um, and in terms of partnerships and collaborations, this, this uh, core technology comes from uh, Destina, which is a uh, University of Edinburgh spin off. Uh, so, Destina developed, the, developed and, uh, and uh, provided us the probes. So, we printed these probes and, and uh, assembled these uh, um, uh, devices at Edinburgh. Then, uh, Genetic PCR Solutions, a Spanish company, developed the uh, amplification uh, kits for these. Uh, and, University of Padova provided us with the DNA. Uh, of, of various uh, NTMs as well as the tuberculosis to be able to, to test these, uh, uh, evaluate these devices within uh, within the EU, and uh, these have now these are now been evaluated, undergoing 
large scale violations and evaluations both in india and russia so without the collaborations here uh, we wouldn't have been able to uh, come up with this uh, come up with this uh, device or this test so uh, so these are the tubes again uh, so we, as you can see we carry around a thousand of these tests in a, easily in a small backpack uh, and these can be carried to uh, carried to uh, small villages uh, for example in india and the test can be conducted even under a tree okay so uh, as, a, as an offshoot of uh, this uh, uh, the the spanish company uh, genetic pcr solutions they also developed their amplification kits to um, uh, differentiate between ntm and, and mtbc uh, as well as mdr tb also we have a, 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 a test now uh, using isothermal amplification using lamp so uh, again you know all, though these kits were manufactured by gps uh, there were uh, clearly inputs from Tessina uh, regarding, uh, uh, for example, uh, the the uh, the size of the of the amplicon, so on and so forth, uh, as well as uh, uh, from the University of Edinburgh and, and Padua, um, in terms of uh, actually uh, doing the uh, evaluations uh, in in EU, uh, and then uh, of course these validations will, uh, are are happening as we speak in in these uh, two two countries, Russia and, and India who are all uh, WHO accredited uh, institutes. Okay, so, uh, oh, yes. So, uh, to, to enable these assays to be conducted, we need uh, uh, the extracted DNA from uh, from TB. Uh, and so, uh, within the consortium, we've developed uh, um, uh, a compact platform that enables us to uh, extract DNA from, uh, uh, from using a cartridge, which is the size of a credit card. So this was led again by Heritage University, but uh, the University of Edinburgh provided the, the chemistry backup as well as the, 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 uh, the biology was uh, uh, in terms of culturing the mycobacterium spumatis or, or doing the DNA extraction uh, along with the Heritage University, while University of Padua actually uh, provided us with the uh, uh, with the positive controls, for example, and uh, again, Russia and India are vital for us to to, to uh, evaluate this uh, device. So, in parallel, uh, we also developed uh, another uh, extraction device. So, this is uh, purely based on uh, a freestyle uh, cycle, uh, and so uh, such uh, uh, device, such simple robust device, I don't think uh, at the moment exists in the market. So, this allows uh, potentially. Uh, a, a, a very uh, easy way uh, uh, that can withstand the the uh, the, uh, the robustness that is required uh, for them to be deployed in uh, in a resource limited environment. Uh, so this was uh, this was uh, as a as a uh, collaboration again, just as it used to be started initially as a discussion between us and the Indian partner, and then it kind of uh, subsequently went from there. <clears throat> so this is uh, uh, coming to the uh, screening of uh, uh, TB uh, using uh, um, uh, using molecular probes, uh, which, which could have the potential to replace uh, the current uh, uh, dyes that are used in sputum cellular microscopy. So this is the kind of basic design of uh, of uh, of the probes. Actually, so it's got a ligand that is. Uh, uh, capable of uh, uh, engaging certain targets that are specific to mycobacterium, and uh, the 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 molecule also has a fluorophore that is environmentally sensitive. That uh, fluor is uh, hundred or thousand fold more in a hydrophobic environment. So we have a kind of a double uh, specificity, uh, and uh, this enables clear distinction between uh, our uh, uh, model organisms, mantis, and uh, and uh, other bacteria. So these dyes are currently under revaluations in uh, in in both uh, uh, Russia as well as in India. Uh, hopefully, we'll all be wrapped up uh, very soon. So in order to be able to uh, detect those uh, uh, bacteria that are stained by uh, our probes, uh, they, we we have also developed a, a very frugal uh, imaging device with the help of our Indian partner who has uh, already. Uh, roll this out uh, in the past to uh, to, uh, uh, to for the detection of malaria as well as uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, complete bird counts uh, within within the Indian setup. 
So uh, this again, uh, uh, there's India has been affected hugely with COVID in the past, uh, uh, you know, few weeks or months. Uh, so there has been slight delay. However, you know, we are confident that this should be this should be up and running, you know, very soon. So uh, in terms of the micro RNAs uh, uh, for uh, for detection of of, uh, of TB and latent TB, um, we have uh, conducted a, a micro RNA discovery study between uh, the University of Padova and University of Edinburgh, uh, collecting samples from University uh, from Edinburgh before COVID, and then relying on some um, uh, bank uh, bank samples from from Padova too. Uh, to make up for the numbers that is required uh, to to, uh, uh, to to complete this discovery study, uh, so this uh, uh, due to COVID and uh, various other uh, technical difficulties, it just been uh, completed a month ago. So we are uh, we have developed the device though, which is a chemiluminescence based uh, technology for uh, detection of uh, TB relevant microRNAs directly from serum samples. So uh, we developed this device based on previously reported microRNAs uh, and uh, we have uh, um, uh, uh, we have optimized it so uh, now we are uh, uh, we are very close to actually synthesizing those uh, 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 probes that are required to detect uh, the, the the microRNAs from our study uh, and also you know all of these uh, will come together uh, uh, either writing up or, or as uh, commercial products in the near future um, so lastly, I would like to talk about the uh, uh, the other product, uh, uh, which is the telemetry and mobile phone applications. So as you can see, we have had various devices, particularly the three uh, devices. One is the spin tube, secondly, the uh, microRNA device, and thirdly, the uh, the device for uh, the for sputum serum microscopy. Uh, so we have developed telemetry for all of these, in the sense these are, uh, uh, these are designed for Data collection and uh, collection at central locations to enable identification of, for example, of uh, TB hotspots in in certain regions. Um, so, but then uh, even though they are uh, developed for those devices, they have the potential to be used on their own uh, as well as as tools for surveillance. So again, you see that uh, uh, this this uh, there is a, a huge amount of collaboration involved here. Uh, so. Uh, and there is interlinking between uh, the Indian partner uh, Shamoka Innovations, who actually developed this, uh, um, developed this uh, uh, one of the one of the app. Heritage University developed another uh, another two, and we are kind of integrating all these uh, three together. And all of these uh, uh, apps could be developed only with the inputs of other people, uh, integrating with our own instruments. As well as uh, the the clinicians that we current, uh, continue to speak to in our, uh, you know with regards to the regulatory requirements, uh, you know the, the data protection, so on and so forth. And of course, the Russian and Indian partners have been able to validate this uh, in their uh, uh, countries to be to to ensure that actually the GPS facilities etc actually works uh, works works well. So this these platforms are also uh, provided with. Uh, Artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities. So, what you see there, for example, as a as a as a uh, as an example, is that uh, uh, in a, with this MT, this app is able to identify that it's a positive case with uh, around ninety seven percent certainty, and this is based on uh, the the teaching that we have provided to the, to the app as is to to detect uh, to detect TB. So. Uh, Hopefully, I've, I've uh, provided uh, with an with a, with a, uh, overview of, uh, of, our collab of how collaborations have hopefully enabled Laras TV to provide a kind of a space for knowledge transfer, innovation, and also uh, potentially entrepreneurship with, uh, with uh, some of the uh, products that, that, that would go into market and, and, and help poor TB patients in the near future. Thank you. Um. Thank you, Sesha, and good to see that your internet uh, allowed you to give the whole presentations without any disturbances. Perfect. Yes, that was a, that was a welcome change, actually. <laughs> um, as of now, I do not see any hands or questions, so people, please either raise your hand or put a question in the chat.
um, and while you're thinking, um, Sasha, can you let us know? Uh, so for, for COVID-19, we have seen a very rapid development of rapid diagnostic tests, which give you results, which is relatively accurate in 15 minutes. Um, do you see that any of the 10 products that you presented will, will be something like that, that can be done by people themselves and very quickly with, uh, without a lot of equipment? Uh, people themselves, no, we're not doing any antigen test or, or, or something like that. So, uh, the, 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 there, there will be a I do think I should have. You, we, we lost you for a while, Sasha. Can you repeat? Uh, no, these tests cannot be done at home. Uh, so, they are all. Uh, uh, either molecular diagnostic test or at least they require a minimal amount of training. They can be done by, uh, not necessarily by somebody with a PhD or an or a, or a undergraduate degree in in, uh, uh, in molecular diagnostics, but they can be tra trained uh, uh, in a few few days or weeks. Anyone with, uh, with a good understanding of you know, good hands, they can be trained. But uh, using this test uh, at home uh, is, is not possible, actually. Uh, we wish. But, uh... <laughs> Indeed. Um, Francis, you raise your hand. Yes, thank you. Very nice presentation, Sasha. I was just wondering, are you, have you got data or are you planning to compare your uh, amplification systems with the, the TrueNAT uh, system that's, that's also made in India and would probably be your closest competitor, I guess? Yes, absolutely. So that's part of the uh, uh, idea. So uh, that, that's what. Uh, that's what. So the TrueNet will our our diagnostics will be tested against TrueNet in in India, and uh, the Russian partner have got their own gold standard uh, test. So we're, our test will be benchmarked against uh, uh, those two gold standards in those two countries. And that's why you know the having the Indian partner as well as Russian partner helps us to to actually truly benchmark uh, uh, our products against uh, against uh, uh, current gold standards in two different countries. And can, can you say what, what interests me? So you work with different companies and uh, also different universities. Working with different universities often isn't that difficult, but do you also have exchange of knowledge between the different companies or that, that didn't work so far in this arrest project? No, no, no. So we, we do actually. So I mean, it took a while. So I mean, uh, I, I talked about all the good things about collaborations. I think there are also some difficult things that we need to address in collaborations, particularly it's a matter of trust between between uh, uh, between partners. In academic and in academia, it works much easier because you know we know what the outputs are going to be. It's going to potentially be a publication. Whereas when commercial interests come into play, then we need to create that. Uh, 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 that environment of trust uh, uh, right from the word go, uh, and uh, you know the way we framed the consortium agreement was was uh, uh, very very uh, useful. But I have to say, you know, uh, we we, we uh, I've been extremely lucky to have uh, someone like Mark Bradley within within the uh, uh, within the within the RSTB consortium. With his vast experience, he was able to extremely guide us, uh, guide me. To, to ensure that these these kind of issues are, are addressed right at the agreement stage, uh, rather than you know leaving it later, and then uh, uh, you know once people agree and sign, then then it becomes much easier. Yeah. Thanks. Can I take other questions to Sasha? I don't see them and we have still some minutes. So is there any lessons learned specifically from the arrest project that you would pro want to provide to the people who have worked together in the care project? So I think it, it would be very nice to have uh, more interactions. I think the, there was lovely uh, presentation, uh, 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 the last presentation. Uh, we would like to discuss with that part uh, uh, I mean, sorry, I'm really bad at names. Actually, I have a very difficult name, um, but uh, that's not an excuse. Uh, so uh, the last presenter, uh, they have really lovely data about uh, uh, 
uh, in a, the, the the drug resistant uh, profiling. So, if it would be possible to to make some links there for us to continually improve the products. I mean, at the moment we we, we have worked on uh, probably the, the the what is there uh, published, but then this drug resistant profile keeps changing. So, people like those who actually do the surveillance on a regular basis would be be extremely uh, uh, ideal to work with. I mean, our our partner in India does that, but worldwide uh, our, our links uh, is always better to make those links and, and uh, continue those collaborations. Ekaterina, I think he was referring. Do yes. you want to react? I don't see her or hear her. Right. So I mean, I can I can reach out to Francesca for, for, for the yeah. also in a sure. Um, so also to Francis, if uh, if if any of your uh, tests become uh, when you when you find those markers uh, uh, when you you know when you, when you hit those uh, uh, really lovely biomarkers, you know where we are. So I'd love to collaborate with you. Sure, that's good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we're getting to the end of this session, and here, the, after this session, there is actually quite a long break of 30 minutes till 11.30 Central European time.